at first glance, everything looked to be okay. Two women had arrived at the Gurnell Leisure Centre at 11am, and as they walked to the building, they passed by a blue Jaguar XJS, which was parked at the edge of the car park. The driver of the Jaguar was sat upright in the driver's seat and appeared to be sleeping. An hour later, the same women approached the Jaguar again as they made their way back to their parking spot. It was now clear that something was very wrong. This is the unsolved murder of Penny Bell. As far as Alistair Bell knew, his wife, Penny, was going straight to work on the morning of the 6th of June, 1991. 43-year-old Penny Bell was a partner in a catering employment company based in Kilburn, North London. Penny lived with Alistair and their two children, Matthew, aged 11, and Lauren, aged 9, in Baker's Wood, Denham, Buckinghamshire. Builders had arrived at their home that morning to continue carrying out building work. The home was also being redecorated and Penny had accepted a delivery of blue patterned Laura Ashley wallpaper and wood samples from a local builder that morning. At 9.40am Penny left home for the final time. She told the builders that she was late for a 9.50am appointment. What is known is that Penny only mentioned this appointment to the builders, and despite Penny's work diary being full of detail, no record of this meeting has been found. The identity of the person she was supposed to meet has not been discovered. The Gurnell Leisure Centre is in Greenford, West London, and is also located near to the A40, a major road that connects London to Fishguard in Wales. The leisure centre is also nine miles from Penny's house and not on her route to work. Around 10am, witnesses saw a car matching the one Penny drove, a Jaguar XJS, driving along Greenford Road with its hazard lights flashing. A woman who looked like Penny appeared to be struggling with a man in the car. One witness described the man as being around 40 years old and he wore a bracelet on his right wrist. He had dark hair and it's possible he had a beard. As the car drove along at what was thought to be 10 miles per hour, the woman turned to other road users for help, mouthing, help me, at them. It's possible that other drivers didn't realise the severity of the situation the woman was in. Several cars overtook her, beeping their horns as they sped past. By the time the two women decided to check on the occupant of the car they'd noticed earlier in the Gurnell Leisure Centre car park, it was too late to offer any help. The car belonged to Penny and she was in the driver's seat. Penny had 50 knife wounds to the chest and arms and had died of her injuries. Her car was parked facing a hedge that bordered the car park perimeter. The attack on Penny only took a couple of minutes. Forensic evidence revealed how the attack was carried out. The weapon was a knife that had a three to four inch long blade. The killer began stabbing Penny from the passenger seat before getting out of the car and walking around to the driver's side. The killer continued the attack either through the open driver's side window or after opening the driver's door. The violence didn't stop there. The killer then returned to the passenger side to commit more violence. A year after Penny's murder, the police said that as many as 30 people may have been in the car park as the killing took place and that no one had come forward. Penny hadn't been sexually assaulted and her handbag was found undisturbed. The wallpaper and wood samples Penny had received that day were laid out on the console between the driver and the passenger seats. Investigators are positive that Penny knew her murderer. 
When Penny didn't collect her children from school, alarm bells began ringing and a neighbour of the bells let Lauren and Matthew wait for their parents at their house. Alistair picked his children up from the neighbour's house and as they arrived home, a detective opened the front door. Lauren and Matthew sat with a police liaison officer at a neighbour's house while Alistair spoke to the police. When the children went home, Alistair opened the front door, sank to his knees and started crying. Lauren and Matthew went to stay with relatives while Alistair was questioned through the night, eventually being ruled out as a suspect. The next day, Alistair identified Penny's body. The police discovered that two or three days before Penny died, she withdrew £8,500 from a bank account she shared with her husband. No trace of this money has been found, even though Penny kept detailed records. It has been theorised that Penny was being blackmailed. In 1992, a friend of the family said he had been with Penny the morning of her death and offered to reveal the events running up to the murder to a newspaper in exchange for £80,000. He claimed that he had been in a secret relationship with Penny and that they had met on the morning of her death to talk about sleeping together. The friend believed that Penny had been murdered by a contract killer. After learning of the friend's claims and finding his fingerprints in Penny's car, the police arrested him but later released him without charge as there was no evidence against him. On Lauren's 10th birthday, an employee of the family told her that her father had been in a relationship with a man before he met Penny. When Lauren asked Alistair about this, he said it was true but that it didn't change the fact that he loved Penny. The police asked Alistair if they could release the information about his sexuality to the public. Alistair agreed, hoping that it would help the investigation into Penny's murder. But the exact opposite happened. The media sensationalised the information and the police went from receiving 250 calls a day to none at all. Penny's case was investigated by a major incident team until 1999. A £20,000 reward had been on offer, 8,000 interviews had been conducted and 2,500 written statements had been taken. In the early 2000s, a specialist crime directorate began investigating the case as part of a review led by the Murder Review Group. Evidence, like Penny's fingernails, went missing for 17 years and when they were found, it was discovered that they had been contaminated. Convicted murderer Robert Knapper was interviewed about three murders from the 1990s, including Penny's, because of the similarities between them, but this hasn't led to any new information. In the years since Penny's murder, Lauren has become estranged from her father. When Lauren turned 19, Alistair asked her to move out, saying he wasn't able to love any more. Alistair had started suffering from depression and Lauren had a breakdown herself at 21. She has made peace with her dad since then, but feels better staying away from him. Lauren's memories prior to Penny's death have been wiped out due to trauma. To try and recover her memories, Lauren has been back to the old family home and has undergone eye movement desensitisation and reprocessing hypnosis. Lauren has spoken to the media several times about her mother's murder and when she became a mother herself, she said, I knew straight away that I wanted to name the baby Penny. At first I wondered if I could say the name every day without it conjuring up all the feelings of pain associated with my mother's death. 
But my mum was such an effervescent, charismatic person that I realised naming my daughter after her was a way of honouring the person she was before this terrible crime happened to her. Having Penny has helped me reclaim my mum from her murder.